That's right, Stephanie. We are here outside of the Tampa Federal Courthouse, where on the top floor in courtroom 17, the Uhuru free speech trial of the century is about to enter its second week. So we're going to recap the first week for you. The first week of the free speech trial of Chairman O'Malley Shatella, Penny Hess, and Jesse Neville left observers shaking their heads and asking how the government has dedicated over 30 FBI agents over the course of three years, conducted military raids on peaceful U.S. residents, offered a $10 million reward for information, and still has no case. With only one witness left, the prosecution has failed to present any actual knowledge or evidence of the government's baseless charges that the Uhuru Three are secret pawns in a Russian government conspiracy to sow political discord and interfere in elections. The government has made the outlandish accusation that Omali Shatella, chairman of the African People's Socialist Party, as well as two leaders of the organization's solidarity component, Jesse Neville and Penny Hess, were paid for and under the control of the Russian government when they took a petition to the UN charging the US with genocide, testified at UN hearings for reparations to African people, published an article opposing the ban on Russian athletes in the Olympics, ran for public office on a reparations platform, and spoke out against U.S.-NATO proxy war using Ukraine against Russia. The Uhuru Three have expressed these same opinions and fought for the right of Black people to vote and run candidates in, op in elected office for over 50 years. The government's first expert witness was a... Uh, professor of political science at Syracuse University. He shared his views on Russian intelligence services, but admitted that he knows nothing about the Uhuru Three case. The prosecution's other expert witness was a counterintelligence and cybersecurity consultant and professor. The government referenced this witness's writings in their response to the Uhuru Three's motion to dismiss, arguing that the term disinformation does not refer to information that is necessarily false, Rather, the government said it refers to information that makes the government look bad. On the stand, this expert witness presented concepts from his latest book. When cross-examined, he confessed he did not have any direct knowledge of the Uhuru Three case. A string of FBI special agents took the stand and gave tedious testimony on each of their narrowly assigned scope of duties. They described photos of possessions found in raids on the defendant's homes, such as books on a shelf and scraps of paper. They read serial numbers from computers and phones. Court observers were incredulous as one FBI special agent took the stand and began to read through the same emails and WhatsApp messages that previous witnesses had already read. A, an FBI digital forensics agent described how he copied and compiled data from seized documents, emails, I, iCloud accounts, and Facebook messages in order to create summary reports consisting of only those portions chosen for him for them to see by their supervisors. In other words, they combine bits of information out of context in order to fabricate a false narrative. The government claims that Chairman O'Malley came into the employment and control of the Russian government in 2015 when he traveled to Moscow to speak at a conference organized by the Anti-Globalization Movement of Russia, an NGO. In his opening argument, Uhuru Three attorney, Mutaki Akbar, turned that story right side up. He reminded the jury that 2014 was a pivotal year for the rise of social movements in the U.S. protesting police violence after a string of police killings of Black people. The Uhuru movement was a prominent voice in those protests. It received many offers of support, including from the anti-globalization movement of Russia. So it was the leadership of the Uhuru movement that attracted support from around the country and the world, it was not the orders of a Russian NGO that caused the Uhuru movement to do the work or express the opinions it had been doing for more than 50 years. Week one of the trial proceedings also included a Russian-born FBI special agent who testified that reading the documents given to her by her supervisor convinced her that the NGO leader uh, of the AGMR, Alexander Ionov, was an asset of Russian intelligence. Then, under cross-examination, she admitted she didn't have any direct contact with any Russian nationals and did not do any independent fact-checking of the documents she was given to read. The prosecution introduced communications from 
the NGO AGMR's, AGMR's uh, president, uh, Ionoff, seeking to discuss Jesse Neville's 2017 campaign for St. Petersburg mayor. Under cross-examination, this FBI agent admitted that the government has no evidence that Neville ever worked with Ionoff on the local electoral campaign, nor did he receive any campaign donations from any Russian. Russian. Chairman O'Malley has explained that while the Uhuru Three are clearly innocent according to the law, the government hopes that the specter of Russia, 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 and black, black, black will sway the jury to rule based on prejudice rather than on facts. The Uhuru Three are hoping that members of the jury will see through the government's fabrication and decide to preserve the U.S. Constitution's First Amendment protection of free speech and dissenting opinion. The trial continues today, Monday, September 9th, with cross-examination of the latest FBI agent, followed by one more government witness. Then the Uhuru Three attorneys will begin their defense, and the trial may go to jury deliberations as early as later this week. The case is being heard on the 17th floor of the Tampa Federal Court. It's the largest courtroom in the courthouse. It was packed with supporters all last week who spilled into an overflow room. You can follow the case on handsoffuhuru.org. Thank you.